Okay, so we are recording this. Um, it is uh, uh, a virtu formal virtual interim of the NetMod working group. General information is on the screen. Um, in the chat session, I hope everyone sees that there's a request to join and add your name to um, the virtual blue sheet. Uh, I just sent it again. I'm not sure if it shows up for everybody. Um, but please join the link there and um, without the colon. I'm not sure. Let's try one more time. Um, yeah, please join. Scroll for the end and add name to the virtual blue sheet. As is always the case in the IETF, uh, please mute yourself if you're not talking. Uh, the as this case is always the, in the IETF, uh, we have our note well. This governs uh, our participation and basically says anything you say here on a mail list um, it becomes part of our permanent record. This meeting is being recorded and will be um, uh, minuted as well. Um, we are using, that's interesting. This says Meet Echo. That's pretty funny. Um, we're not using Meet Echo. Um, we're using WebEx. And um, please use the chat for the queue. In the past, we've asked to use Jabber. We're still making that request, but the reality is people aren't jo joining Jabber. Right now, it's me and um, uh, a bot. Uh, so if you feel like you want to put something in the chat, uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, but it, it, it won't be part of the minutes unless we um, uh, uh, talk about it uh, on the audio. Again, blue sheets and material. Uh, thanks to the presenters who put the material together, that is all uploaded. Our agenda, um, what, why are we here? We really want to try to get some feedback from um, those who may have been less active on the versioning topic um, in the working group. And there's two open discussions that the authors would like to, or two open topics that the authors would like to talk about. Uh, I did add a link, although it didn't show here properly, it shows on the, in the PowerPoint version. Um, actually, I added the link to the materials, uh, the slides from IETF 108, which is, gives a sort of a, um, a snapshot of where things were at, I'm sorry, IETF 109. Um, where they were, as well as an overview of all the documents. So if you're less familiar with the material, I suggest you um, you open up the, the materials page um, and look at that last package as we're going through it. Um, as a reminder, um, we would like, you know, we're gonna be working like this for a while. Uh, 110 is already online. Uh, we can do virtual interims whenever um, authors request, as as they did in this in this case, um, or when we see an issue. We also can do informal meetings. Um, I'll also mention that the IETF gather is still available for anybody. If you are doing um, informal meetings, I think it's a good idea if you include um, the working group, a notification of the working group that you're doing that because. Um, that thereby the working group is understands what's going on. Um, maybe you'll have some people who participate to learn what's going on, or even better, you'll have uh, new contributors to the work. So um, please do keep everyone uh, in the loop as you go on. So um, with that, we're going to jump off to the first topic. I'll bring up the agenda just so we have it. And we are getting a more. A little I hear Rashad. Are you ready to go with? Hey guys, I'm hearing a fair bit of noise. Same here. That's better. Hey, just before Rashad goes, I was going to introduce uh, something. I apologize. Uh, uh, Lou, I should have, we should have put that in the agenda, but. Uh, go ahead, please. So j just before Shad starts, I was going to just give a little bit of context for people beyond what uh, Lou mentioned there. 
Yeah. So it's Jason's turn. If you're not speaking. Okay. Uh, my name is Jason Stern. So I'm I'm um, part of a group of uh, of us from the NetMod working group that are meeting in uh, weekly calls. So um, those are those are uh, everybody's invited from the working group. By the way, to those uh, you've hopefully seen some occasional invites and minutes on the uh, mailing list. Um, there's probably about a set of six to eight of us who who show up fairly regularly for these calls, mostly the authors of the drafts um, from a fairly wide variety of organizations. So there's people from a number of different vendors. Um, and uh, so it's a fairly good cross section of people, but we have been finding it challenging to converge on some key issues around the versioning drafts. Um, some of the topics are a bit um, difficult and even within the the kind of the weekly meeting group, the author group, um, we're finding it challenging to um, to resolve a few issues, and would really have been um, interested in engaging more people in the working group. So that's one of our our challenges is to uh, just try to get a, a bit more people involved. And so this one of the next steps we we wanted to try was um, a set of virtual interim meetings where we uh, really zoom in on a few key topics and try to have a bit more time to discuss those specific topics and issues. Um, so we actually expect to call further virtual interims over the next little while. Um, and today is the, is the first one. So today what we want to focus on is some of the key issues around what we, I guess we kind of consider our primary draft, which is the Yang module versioning draft. And there's two topics of particular interest we're going to try to tackle today. So Chad is going to lead the first one, which is um, related to imports. And um, Jan is going to lead the second one, which is about white space. And what we're going to do is allocate about 30 minutes to each of those topics. And then uh, at, for the last 30 minutes of this meeting, we'll come back to whichever topic or, or both if needed, whichever one we think is the most valuable to try to, uh, to progress. Um, as always, you know, any finalization of decisions will be brought back to the working group uh, on the mailing list. So that's about it, and I'll... Uh... For, 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 for Sean, it, it seems your mic is the one that's noisy. Is there any way you can clean that up? Oh. Um, give um, me... Turn, turn, Rashad, turn off the auto gain control. What's happening is, is when you're not talking, your gain is going way up. Just turn off the auto gain control. I'm sorry, I missed that. Turn off what? Um, use your mic as push to talk. Only unmute when you're going to talk, please. Okay, yeah. Um, just one second. I'm going to try to go back to my headset, okay? Jason, back to you. Yeah, sorry. I was I was just wrapping up. So Rashad's gonna <laughs> Rashad's leading in for the first topic here, and uh, and then we'll so we'll stick with that for about half an hour. And again, everyone, we only have five of the people, fourteen people on uh, Code EMP. Please add yourself to the end. And I'll put the list. Put it again in chat. So is this any better than before? It's fine when you're talking. When you're not talking, it, it gets bad. So just use your mic, your mute button is pushed to talk. Uh, you're up. OK, next slide, please. OK, so yeah, officially, I'm Richard Raman. I'm part of the group of authors and contributors. And today, I'm going to be leading the uh, discussion on two issues related to versioning and imports. As Jason said previously, those are things we've been talking about for at least a couple of years. And uh, we've had a hard time getting uh, consensus. Uh, maybe on the second one, the group now has consensus, but in the first one, we've been going back and forth. So the first issue is uh, the impact of doing non-backwards compatible changes on imports and specifically, uh, whether we need a new extension uh, statement for imports, which is revision or derived compatible uh, here. And then there's the link to the uh, GitHub issue. 
The second issue is the impact of changing an import statement, whether that's backwards compatible or non-backwards compatible. And again, uh, here's the link to the issue in GitHub. Uh, that's the intro. Next slide, please. Okay, impact of doing NBC changes on imports. So the first bullet there, uh, just a reminder that in the uh, module versioning draft, uh, it's been a while, we added the uh, extension revision or, or derive to import statement. It's basically to fix what we believe are issues related to import by strict date. Uh, by doing revision or derived, um, we're actually uh, reducing the set of importable revisions to those which are derived from the revision, which is the argument to that statement. Uh, if we consider module A you know, at 1.0, which is importing module B at 2.0, uh, let's assume that there's only major version 1 and 2 for B, uh, no 3. This means that A will be importing some 2.y.z of module B. We don't know which one, at least a version which contains 2.0.0. Now, on the third bullet, you know, we're basically saying now, you know, consider if there's a new version of module B 3.0.0 that we did NBC changes. Uh, with that statement revision or derive, module A may end up importing 3.0 because it includes its derived from 2.0. And that could break clients using module A. Uh, on the other hand, you know, it's also possible that A does not want the changes in in module B, uh, made in version 3.0 of module B. It's also possible that module A wants those changes. So we've been going back and forth on this one, and we're, so the point, what we're basically coming down to is, do we want another extension, which is revision or derive compatible, the key word there being compatible, to limit the uh, import set to backwards compatibles. Uh, versions. So, for example, 2.00 derived compatible would limit the imported version to 2. Dot something. Uh, 3. Dot 3 four, versions 3 and 4 major version would not be candidates. Um, so that's the essence of what we've been discussing, and you know many of the contributors can attest to this. We've been going back and forth. You know, one week we think yes, one thing we think no. And actually, I find that personally, Jurgen's reply to the mailing list over the weekend was pretty accurate in terms of what that's the main reason why we're having a hard time closing on, on this, because we don't know what we want. Um, next slide, please. Just a quick reminder and import. Um, the first one is the regular import by date. Uh, that's in RFC 7950. Uh, the second one is the revision or derived that we've been talking about. That's in module versioning. So we're basically saying we want 2.0.0 or anything derived from version 3, version 4, uh, major versions 3 and 4. What we're considering and discussing is whether we want revision or derived compatible, which would limit it to only versions which are compatible with 2.0.0. Next slide, please. So we're going to go through two quick examples about, you know, why maybe we won't want that new extension and why maybe we would not. Uh, the first example is actually from Rob, which we've discussed in our, our meetings, is the case I mean, we're all looking at hypothetical examples. You know, if we want to obsolete IF index from ITF interfaces, and IF interfaces would be the module which is being imported. Um, so, yeah, we consider we're obsoleting that, and ITF interfaces, let's say, would go from version 2 something to 3.0.0. With revision or derive 2.0.0, all the importing modules which are using that statement would be getting the new version because 3.0.0 is derived from 2.0.0. With compatible, you would not get it because you'd be limiting to, to you know, to basically to version 2 up. 
and all the importing modules would need to be modified to be able to import 3.0. And that's a bit like the same problem we have by revision uh, importing uh, by date. Uh, so, you know, in this case, we believe that um, we would not want to use the compatible uh, extension. Next slide, please. So another example, again, this is a hypothetical example. We're considering you know, module B, which has a grouping containing a node, VPN ID, which is an integer. Module A imports module B and uses that grouping. Uh, let's say now there's a change in module B where VPN ID is changed to be a string. That's version 3.0.0. Now, you know, it's possible that some either specific platforms or implementations or servers might want to keep VPN ID as an integer, while others might want it as a string. Um, if you use the derived ex extension, um, you everybody would get the new definition of that grouping, of that node in that grouping. Maybe that's good, maybe that's not good. With the compatible uh, flavor of that ex extension, you would keep the old definition. Again, maybe good, Maybe not, not, not good, depending on what the, uh, what the requirement is. So this is a case where, you know, we believe, well, at least I believe, I know we've, uh, we don't have unanimity on that, that both statements are useful. And, you know, module A could be branched accordingly. Um, and then next slide. Uh, next slide is the final slide on this topic, which is a summary. So again, you know why we would want the compatible, the pros we've, we've spoken about, you know, there's no accidental breakage. You know exactly what merger version you are, are, are getting. You know, you can use it for reactive okay, repair. Uh, that's something, you know, uh, we've been discussing recently where, you know, if you use the other uh, the wide open one and you realize that it's breaking your module, you can revert to the compatible uh, extension to um, so that your module would work. Um, the cons, well, those also, you know, we've been discussing, um, well, it's very similar to import by date. If you want something which is not covered by your major version, you need to go to all the importing modules and change them. Um, there is non-backwards compatible fixes, which you may want and you don't get automatically. It could be confusing too. I mean, we've, always, we've already had the feedback from a few people that the whole solution is a bit confusing and complex and having two different extensions to do similar stuff um, might be confusing to um, authors of Yang modules. Um, now I think it's the time for comments and questions on this specific issue. I see Jason has his hands up, although uh, feel free to use plus Q minus Q. <laughs> Jason, go ahead. Okay, thanks. Um, Jason Stern, I just, I just wanted to bring in a couple of key points from the emails that um, Jurgen and Andy uh, sent over the weekend. So Jurgen raised a, a good point, which we've also touched on as well within the group. And that is, you know, there's a point, there's a question as to whether we have any import by revision statement at all in the Yang modules themselves, and whether we rely on techniques that are outside the module to indicate dependencies between modules. Um, and you know, there's several um, examples of, of how that works. The, one of the ones, I, I, I only looked at one of the links that Jurgen sent, but at least the first one for uh, Cargo, it does, um, you know, out of band or separate indication of, of uh, dependencies. But I did notice it seems to have the concept of um, revision or derived compatible. So when it, it mentions you can import, um, when you can like combine certain versions of things, it seems to have the logic that you can you can include anything as long as the major semver digit does not change. So so that one's a kind of a out of the module solution. 
um, that has semantics similar to the uh, derived or compatible. Um, and it's something we've discussed in the authors group about whether, you know, packages is that solution for Yang. Because packages is uh, can indicate what modules go together, although it's a very strict set of, of very specific versions. Um, just one thing I noticed. The second is Andy's reply, I think was a, a little bit, to a degree, the opposite. He seems to be advocating in his email to, to at least fix the problem we have in Yang where you can only specify a specific version. And he was, he was kind of uh, asking, you know, please just solve that problem and seemed to be indicating that he wanted a, um, a version or derived uh, concept, but not, not the or compatible one. Now, I, you know, I think I'd saw um, Jurgen join the call, so he might be able to clarify some of his thoughts, but um, I don't think Andy's on. So I, I think there's, you know, even in those two emails, we're seeing a little bit of, um, of, of the conflict we're also getting in the, in the group about how to, how to resolve this one. That's it for me. It's hollow. Hello? It's hollow. Yes, I'm on mute. Yes. Hi. I'm, I'm, I was a little bit confused because, yeah, I, I think if module A is importing module B, and if module B has a non backward compatible update, uh, then if you import the non backward compatible update, you are basically creating a non backward compatible change to module A. So I'm, I'm more in favor of, say, revision of the rival compatible because if, if you really want to, imp to do this network, to have this ripple effect, you have to do a new, a new revision, a new major revision for module A as well to signal up that uh, the new draft, the new module is non backward compatible. Otherwise, we have hidden uh, non backward compatible changes by done by the import, uh, which makes it difficult to understand, <laughs> in my opinion, what is backward compatible or what is not. Jason, go ahead. Just right, I'm being turn. slow on finding my unmute. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I just to address Italo's point. Um, I, I th hopefully I'm interpreting correctly, but I think Italo was um, was saying that um, he's leaning towards having the derived or compatible because of the concern that A could inadvertently be including a non-backwards compatible version of B. Um, the problem is that just because B changed in a non-compatible way doesn't mean it necessarily affects module A. So the feeling from at least some of the uh, authors, some of the group from the call or weekly call is that most of the time, especially in standards modules, a change to B, even if it's non-backwards compatible, is is actually not likely to impact A. It may, but often there's going to be changes to B that maybe aren't even used by A. Or in standards bodies, you know, B might be changed in an NBC manner, but they're, they'd be conscious about trying not to break things for A. So it's not guaranteed, but our worry was that we would be uh, a little bit too pessimistic if we always um, enforce people to use the um, derived or compatible inclusion. And it may, it may mean that someone spins B in a way that is non-backwards compatible, but it doesn't affect A. But if, if they had used derived or compatible in A, that would force A to go have to go back and re-spin to include the new version of B. So we're we're feeling that it may, if derived or compatible is used, 
it may result in too much churning of of modules where it was unnecessary. Apollo, you're up. Also, uh, okay. if you're the only one in the queue. Feel free to just unmute and go. Oh, okay, okay, thank you. Okay, yeah, I understand the uh, the, the drawback, uh, uh, but my concern is that the risk is much higher because the big problem is that you don't know. You don't know whether the module, the change, the non worker compatible change in module B is going to affect module A, especially you don't know that when you write a module A, because you don't know what uh, what will happen in the future when you do module B. And uh, and then you can really assess uh, at every time you make a change, whether uh, when you do the change on module B, then you can assess whether this non backward compatible change in module B is back is affecting or not module A, and then you can update module A in a backward or non backward compatible way to use the new version of module B. The, uh, the, the, even, the things become even worse when you, you go and, and you have this problem coming up over multiple uh, uh, import. So think about the case that uh, your change in module B is affecting module C, which is importing module A, <laughs> which is importing module B. That's, so you can have a module which is non backward compatible, because uh, a, a, a module which is imported uh, many steps behind you is non backward compatible. It's, it's very difficult to understand what's going to happen, in my opinion. So it's uh, Rob Wilton here as a contributor. So um, I think that the, the, the concern I tell you is that actually, if you have that sort of fixed dependency or with that range dependency, you end up with everything being too much in lockstep. So you start finding the case that, in the, like the ITF um, interfaces example, when you deprecate a node that nobody's using, you would then um, have to, if everyone was using revision or derived compatible, you'd have to update like 50 Yang models to be able to use that new um, mod version of ITF interfaces without deprecated or obsoleted node. So I think actually it's too constraining. And I think the answer is, by and large, what Jürgen is saying is that, that really um, compatibility between Yang models is something that should be done by and large outside the module definitions themselves. In, and solved in a separate way. Packages might be something that could be extended to that. I haven't I haven't thought about that, but that might be some some other way. I do also have sympathy though for Andy's comments where it's it's useful to say when I write this Yang module, I've got a minimum dependency on this other Yang module because it defines a particular type um, or identity or a path that I'm using or augmenting. So I still think that the revision or derived version of import is is helpful on a pragmatic basis when people are looking at Yang models and trying to build them together into cohesive sets. So my proposal here is to keep the revision or derived, but don't do the revision or derived compatible. But with the aim that the revision or derived, its only purpose is effectively specifying a minimum dependency that's useful as a hint at, at sort of compile time to specify other the Yang models that would be useful. Uh, Lou is contributor. I think it's worthwhile to think of, um, you know, what problem we're trying to solve here. And um, uh, Rob, I, I think you actually gave the answers um, <laughs> for, for for this point. Um, one is uh, as we're designing modules, being able to specify things. Well, I guess this is um, uh, from Andy, but mi specify some uh, minimum dependencies or minimum requirements. Uh, and keeping in mind when we're doing things that are really backward compatible and when they're not. And then the second one is, is as we're implementing, um, what combination makes sense? And perhaps Yang packages is an answer, but I, I think we're really talking about two separate problems, and I think it's worthwhile to keep those separate, keep, keep that in mind when talking about solutions. And apparently, with your hat on, apparently that was a conversation stopper because I don't have, see anyone else in queue. Rob? I, I was just going to basically say, yes, I agree. I, I think that's right. That it's, it's two separate problems and that they having so, separate solutions for the two probably makes sense. No hat. Yeah, I think you and I are in violent agreement here. Um, 
Jason, since you're sort of managing the section, do you want to try to get more feedback on this topic or do you want to move on? Um, this It feels like maybe a good time to move to the other topic, but um, maybe we'll touch base with the group at the end uh, if there's time to come back to this in case, you know, people's brains are churning and want to uh, revisit this. So let, I'd propose we switch over to to Jan's um, white space discussion and um, and then we'll re revisit if we have time to come back to this. We actually have one more issue. Oh, um, I apologize. You're right. Sorry, there was part two. Sorry, Rob. Rashad, I forgot about that. I, I oh, OK, uh, I thought Rob was in queue, but he just removed himself. OK. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead, Rashad. Uh, thank you. Um, so that issue has also been fairly contentious in, in the past. It's basically the impact of you've got the importing module, which says I want 2.0.0 or derived. And then um, we change that statement to be 3.0.0 or derived. And, uh, you know, going back to what Italo, Rob, and Jurgen said earlier in email, it's again one of those cases where we don't know what we're getting. And uh, not only do we not know what the impact uh, of changing that statement is, it also depends of what specific part of B A is using or not using. Um, so the you know the contributors who meet every week, we believe that such a change in the import statement should be considered to be a backwards compatible change. Um, that that revision label of the module really represent the schema defined in that module and that we had to use other means whether it's yang packages or yang library for clients to have the full scheme of you um you know just just you know guessing in some way that the impact of that statement is bc or nbc on a is 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 not is, is not correct you know it may be the change is in a grouping which is not used by A, or it could be in a grouping which is used by A. We just don't know. Um, so we can't just say, you know, always tag that as, as, as NBC. We really have to consider the uh, full, full schema. And last point there is, you know, the version label of the uh, Yang package would be updated according to the impact on the packages schema. Uh, next slide, please. We also considered, you know, depending on, 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 on the impact, you know, to decide whether it's BC or NBC change. Uh, one, we believe it could be error prone. Uh, you know, it's hard for a tool to go and figure that out. There's potential ripple effect uh, where, you know, if you got a, you know, a hierarchy of modules, including others that this could ripple uh, up to the top, so it could be many changes. I mean, changes have to be done in many modules. And last, you know, we believe that you know having to figure it out is not needed because clients, as mentioned before, have to look at the whole schema. And this is the last slide. So I guess comments and questions on this. So again, if you're uh, the only one in queue, feel free to jump in. So, Rob? Um, so, again, with no hats, I was just going to say, is if there's no comments on this, the, the other question to what to worth, that's worth asking is, is anyone opposed to the change that we're proposing or the, the solution we're proposing on the previous slide? I.e. that if you change the import, it's regarded as a um, backwards compatible change. So is anyone opposed to that resolution? Please speak up now if you are.
I'm I'm not opposed. I actually wanted to give a supporting statement for it. I I think you know if I think the you know the version of A should speak to the changes that are in A. And if A includes B, that's fine, but the version of B should speak to the changes in B. So if we have a you know an an, an import chain of A imports B and B imports C and C imports D E F, I think it would be a mess to try to go back and to track against module A, you know, what all changed in those other modules and whether it affects A. I think it's, I think there's the only real practical way here is that the version of A speaks to what changed in A and the version of B speaks to what changed in B. And that's independent of whether A includes B or whatever else they all include. Any other comments? Um, <clears throat> so this is Jürgen. I'm, I'm wondering whether this, this needs to be a hard rule because there could be corner cases where you really think that the data type that I'm using changed in such a way that the semantics actually change in the module. So it it might default to be a, a backwards compatible change, but it might be cases where it's not a backwards compatible change. Um, this, so that's an interesting question as to whether module A is allowed to then bump his version. So I, two, two thoughts on that. One is, in general, in our specifications so far, um, we've generally leaned towards saying that, you know, when there is definitely a change, you must bump the revision. But we are um, we are not preventing someone from bump from false positives. We, we absolutely want to prevent false negatives, but we allow false positives. In other words, even if you aren't certain, etc., you're allowed to bump a version. So. So, you know, strictly speaking, you're going uh, module A is perfectly allowed to bump the version if they wish, um, even if something directly in module A didn't change. Um, so we're not preventing that. As to whether we'd recommend that, um, our feeling is that, you know, when when you're looking at a schema that a server supports and and whether a client can talk to that server and use that schema, it has to consider the whole set of modules that make up that schema. So if A includes B, you know, the, the server and the client both have to look at A and B and any other modules in that set. And they have to look at whether there's been an NBC change in any of them. And then they have to go look at those NBC changes to say, well, does this affect my implementation? Does is this a part of the model that I use? So I would not actually advocate myself that A would bump its version just because B made a change, even even if B did something that's NBC. Um, I think the server and the client should realize and understand that because they're they're looking at A and B and all modules in their schema, and they'll see that the version for B bumped, and they'll look into the implications of that. It must be, I think this is consistent with what was said before. So if the import by revision is only used to say what is the minimum version you need to import, has nothing to say about whether your uh, revision is backward compatible or not with the previous one. By I mean, we are low on backward compatible uh, 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 changes by import, huh? and then you, you we move to the to the user to figure that out. That's consistent with what you said before. Yeah, a user to figure it out, although to be clear, module B would have an NBC marking. 
So the user would be told that a change happened. They don't just have to, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. the Go, user will yeah. know that there is an NBC change in module B, and then it has to figure it out whether it has an impact on module A or not. <laughs> you know, you don't know from from the model. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, when they see an NBC change, they have to go look at what change and where and how it affects their implementation. You know, whether it's included by A or not, they have to look at the specific change in the end and and figure out whether it impacts them. But it will be indicated. It'll just be only indicated in B, not kind of by proxy in in A's revision. I think it's fun time. Uh, all right, so yeah, uh, just trying to see if I understand correctly here. As a module writer, uh, I see that it's still difficult to predict the impact by this uh, import by revision, right? So we don't know how the model B changes will impact A and C. So in normal cases, in most cases, when I write a module, I assume I still use the import with no revision. Am I right? Unless I, I know expect uh, explicitly what the impact will be. I think what we're saying is that we um, you change the version of the of the module where you made the changes. You, I mean, by default, I mean, I'm not sure whether we're going to prohibit changing import version of importing modules, but we're saying definitely by default, you don't change the versions of the importing modules, but also something else. It's not just a client having to figure that out, is you have a package and the package will have a version number. And what we've discussed is, you know, if a, if the impact of the change in B is NBC on A, well, the the version of the Yang package, which includes A and B, would be changed accordingly. If it's a different package where the importing module are not impacted by the change in the importing module, the Yang package version would be changed differently. It would not show an NBC change. Right, so we have to rely on the other mechanism, like the Yang packages or others. So the usefulness of this uh, imported by revision is uh, very limited. Yeah, I mean, it comes down to what, you know, many others, Jürgen, Rob, Lou, and all that have said, Andy, that, you know, it would specify a minimum version. That's where we seem to be, that's what we seem to be aligning on. So Rashad, I think you're you have yourself in queue. Is there something else you want to make? And if not, then over to Joe. Um, sorry, I forgot to take myself out of the queue. I already said what I had to say. I guess next is Joe. Thanks. Uh, I uh, first, what's on the slide? Um, I agree with. Um, I, I wanted to go back to what Jurgen was saying, though, because um, something uh, Jason you said, which was um, if A is importing. Um, B and let's say B um, A updated its its uh, import to say now we're going three and yeah you would see that th that that module B does have uh, an NBC uh, marker in there. I, I I like what Jurgen was saying and certainly in the Simber draft we do have language that says you can if you have a reason to you can bump the the major version number um, indicating an NBC change for. Um, whatever reason, obviously you should use that with caution. But uh, on that data type thing, I, I think if, if you know in module A that when you, when you change your import statement to say, I want this new major revision of module B and MBC, 
and, and you understand the impact that's going to have, I think flagging that for your users, uh, the consumers directly in module A is useful. Um, and so I, um, I, I, I agree with not making this hard and fast. I think this is good guidance that it's, an, that it's a BC change to change the import, but having a, a way to do that um, when you know that there's going to be a, a usability impact is, is a valuable thing. So uh, it's Rob here, again, as a contributor. I, I actually almost think, so I'm not quite sure on Jürgen's one, but I think that in terms of some of the where this discussion is going to is rather than the import being thought of as a way of checking compatibility, really the only time you should probably bump the import uh, minimum version number is if you've got some dependency in that new module. So if a new type's been added in, then you might want to bump it, but otherwise arguably you shouldn't need to do that. Um, so given that basis, I wonder whether then it should ever be an MBC change. I wonder whether it, 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 tying the two together is, is a mistake. And actually the, the text about when you bump this, uh, the version number is when you have a new dependency and hence it isn't really tied to what the version number is, it's tied to some dependency you have. I think I'm, I'm the only one in queue. Um, let's say it's not a new, um, a, a new type. It's, it's a truly NBC change to an existing type that you happen to be using in A. Um, and you understand the impact of moving to say what, what, what 3.0 did in B and you wanna, you wanna further clarify or illustrate or whatever, word you want to use to, to the consumers of your module A. That's at least what I had in my head. Uh, maybe a, a type got, um, after analysis, got further refined um, or you know, shrunk in, in scope or something, and, and, and that you want to bubble up. Um, uh, it, it would make sense, I think, um, to bump the, to, to flag that NBC change in A as well. But, but that's the case. I wonder whether we should be trying to solve that not in the modules and the module imports, but solving that outside of the packages level. So it feels almost like that, that's a metadata information because the, the module, if you haven't changed A, uh, then it was still compatible with the older version of B anyway. That hasn't really changed. You're just saying now as a user, when people are using A, I think that they should really be using this later version of A and this later version of B, and we know that they work together. But I, I wonder if by having that relationship in the imports, that's sort of conflating two different things. One is the minimum version you need to get these things to compile, and the other one is which version should you be using together for, for compatibility purposes. Uh, and to be clear, I'm not... I'm not totally opposed to what Jürgen's suggestion is. I just wonder whether having that room, at least to start with, means it's more likely people are going to put the wrong thing here and change it in an NBC way when they don't need to, and whether it'd be safe to start off by limiting it to, to BC and only, and if there were problems, then you could relax the rule and say, obviously, you can make NBC changes anyway. And as, as Jason says, if the text allows that, then they still have the freedom to make that change regardless. I, I, Joe Clark again, I, I think that's what I was saying, um, that, that we have text that, that says you could, um, but in general, this is the thing that you would, that, that would be recommended. Though I guess you would have to change the word always if you would allow for something else. Um, but I, I also understand what you're saying about packages too, and how that kind of separates the two issues. Jason, yeah, I guess I'm I'm echoing the same sentiment that um, 
we can say aloud, I, I would go a bit stronger and say it's not suggested. And I think we probably should actually in the draft explain that separation of purpose that um, we could say, look, it's allowed if you really feel that, you know, this, we can say it's not prevented, but it's not recommended. The recommended solution for, you know, describing dependencies is, is packages. By the way, the, 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 the term we not recommended is certainly one of our terms also should with explanation would also cover that. We don't have should always, so. Okay. That would be must if you really thought it was. Um, sounds like we've actually reached closure on this point. That's great. Yeah, I think just given the time, I think we should we can come back to this if there's more time, but we do uh, we do definitely want to allocate some time for the white space issue. Yeah, I, so, on this part, I think I heard some closure, which is if it's a should with an expl explanation or um, you know recommended or rec not recommended with explanation. I always like the positive versus the negative, but that's a personal comment. All right. Yeah, so we can bring that back to the list um, to just kind of ratify and see if there's further further debate. We ready for the next topic? This is Jan. You're really low. Is that so? I'll try to speak up a bit then. Uh, go ahead. Okay, so next slide, please. So as, as we know today, uh, there is a way to identify the version of modules by date, but those dates sp spell out exactly nothing about what the contents is or have it changed from one version to the other. So that's the purpose with this Yang semantic versioning to add classification of changes into three different classes. First, we have the non-backwards compatible changes where you step the first digit. We have backwards compatible changes where you step, step the second digit. And then we have editorial changes that has no functional difference where you step the third digit. So you would have something like 2.2.1 .2 .2 or something. Next slide, please. Um, so what came up here when it comes to white space is that uh, some people said that, well, there's something called insignificant, insignificant white space, which actually is a fourth category uh, where you would not uh, detect changes to insignificant white space uh, in your versioning at all. It, it sort of would, would have it's been stepping the fourth digit, but we don't have a fourth digit, so we don't step anything. Or do we treat, well, every change of the module is, a, is an editorial change at least. So you step the third digit, even if you just align some tab stops or remove some additional white space at the end of a line, or somebody edited the file in Windows and got different line endings or something. So that's, that's really the question that we have to answer. And if we decide that, well, there should be some sort of changes to Yang files that should not be detected by the version step, well, then exactly what is insignificant white space? Uh, I think most people agree that it would only be outside Yang literal. So if it's inside quotes, it would always be a change, even if it's just changing a double space to a single space. But I suppose that's up to, to this debate as well. If you change the indentation, is that why insignificant white space change or not? If you add or remove blank lines, is that insignificant white space? What if you use other kinds of space characters? I mean, we all have tabs, obviously, but there are also other UTF-8 space characters, like vertical tabs and, you know, all sorts of stuff. Uh, should we use UTF-8 attributes for white space to detect this and so, if so? And then, of course, uh, Comments are also have no particular, they have no effect to the interpretation of the Yang module or should not have, or you should, would not have. So if you change a comment, would that be a white space change in this case? Next slide, please. So why is this even important? Why do we 
need to specify uh, if, if we care about those white space changes or not. And that's really where uh, we get back into this with checksums that was mentioned earlier. Uh, if you want to compute checksums, obviously any change at all to a Yang module would matter quite a bit because the standard tools that you have out there, they would be counting every byte in the file. But we, you could also define a sort of cleaning operation where you normalize all the white space in Yang files. You specify what the line endings should be like, or maybe you treat them as a single space. All double space is uh, replaced by single space. All other kind of white, white space characters like tabs or whatever are replaced by spaces. And then you take that normalized Yang representation and compute checksum over that. Or we decide that, well, this whole business with checksums is actually not important. And then we don't need to say anything about uh, how you compute checksums or whether a white space change is a different version or not. We can just leave that aside. Uh, next slide, please. List the implications and the advantages of it each. And of course, uh, we didn't, I didn't want to list all the disadvantages because that's only the advantages and all the other slides. So I'm only trying to be positive here. So if you treat uh, Yang files as sort of binary files, uh, then you can use all the existing, let's say MD5 or SHA-256 or something tools that exist on the market and just apply that. And this agrees pretty, pretty well with the intuitive feel that people have for, for how versioning and checksums work. And you can even use the things like, okay, you see file size being different between two Yang models, then you know they are different versions uh, when you have this sort of binary approach. And it's also easy to identify uh, the latest version of a module, even if there's only white space changes, because there's the, the version number signifies which one is the newer one. So that if somebody did fix up the white space to align the, the indentation or whatever it was, or remove some double spaces or clean up the line endings, whoever is going to make the next version of that can see, oh, here's the one I should be working off of. Otherwise, there's a risk if they have the same version number, some, somebody will go and edit uh, the not so clean white space uh, version of the same number. We can go to the next slide. Uh, if you have this white space normalized Yang representation and, and uh, work with that, uh, you would be treating the modules as text files basically. And then we need to specify in extreme detail how this white space normalization procedure should work. And I think most people will feel that is relatively easy until they start actually doing that. Uh, but this has some advantages. You can be a little bit more relaxed when it comes to editing files on Windows or transferring over FTP uh, using text modes and stuff. You, yeah, so as long as the semantic content is the same, you can basically go on and use it. Don't have to worry so much, maybe. Next slide, please. This is the last slide. Uh, and uh, we could also say that we don't want checksums because this is too complicated. Uh, and then we, we can actually duck down and not talk about white space changes at all. Just ignore that. It's not gonna matter much anyway if you don't have checksums. And uh, we would have to drop the checksum ID from the Jank packages uh, draft in that case. But it means quite a bit less of work. And this is a way out if we think this is getting out of hand. And with that, uh, I'll let the moderators uh, moderate the queue. Uh, actually, you should feel free to run the queue. Um, should I? Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, it's a little more interactive that way. Very good. Then. So can you tell me who is first in queue? Because I see okay. a lot of different... I so I'm, I just added, sorry, I'll just jump in. I'm the only one in the queue at the moment. Yeah, I was going to say, I think Jason's the only one. <laughs> okay. okay. Jason Stern. Um, yeah, so your last um, slide just made me realize that checksums is one use case, uh, well, is one factor that's making us wonder about this. The other, even if we didn't have checksums, though, I guess one question is, you know, if we 
if we don't track the difference between two versions of a module, so so let's say let's say we have our module A and at version one zero zero, and then the authors or whoever decides to do some formatting cleanup where they fix up some description alignments, they add some nicer tabs, et cetera. Um, and then the, the question is now you now you have kind of a cleaned up version where you haven't done anything significant, but you've just kind of cleaned up the presentation of the module. If if we don't track that with the minor digit, then we would have floating out there in the Yang space version one zero zero non cleaned up and version one zero zero cleaned up. And there'd be no way to specifically identify or formally request or name the cleaned up one. So what I mean, what if someone says, well, no, 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 I want to I want to give me the cleaned up one, please. I want to edit that. Like there's no separate name for that or identifier. So, I mean, even, even outside of whether they're doing checksums, it strikes me as maybe useful to be able to give a unique identifier to the cleaned up version that you just did. Personally, I agree totally. So um, I've added myself in the queue. Hopefully, again, as a contributor, that others will comment on this. Um, I think the key question here to me is, is what does the semantic version number apply to? Is Does it apply to the file or does it apply to the statements within the file? And the reason I think that matters is in terms of tooling, that if you run a, a tool that p pulls in that Yang module um, and it's going to then process it, should it care if the white space is different between those two files? Should it care if there's comments that are different between these two files that get stripped out as part of that import process? That the actual API is defined by the Yang in both those two cases is identical because the comments don't have any effect to what the Yang's doing, it doesn't affect the descriptions, uh, neither does the white space. So I think that's the key thing that needs to be solved here. And I think it needs to be solved regardless of the checksums. I think that is something that has a, it has an implication on the result, depending on what the solution is. Um, but I think it needs to be resolved regardless. And one other aspect um, that's also interesting here is the issue that came up about is if you generate the Yang programmatically from another source of data, for example, like from Yin, or maybe um, you they get converted from some other schema format. Then the question again is that um, if the white space is significant, that may make it harder than if it becomes generalized, then you could have two tools producing the same structural yang with different white space formatting, and they still have the same um, semantic version number. Um, I'll respond to part of that. I guess one, one thought is, um, so we do have, I mean, so the, the trick is the module versioning draft doesn't, um, you know, is independent of which um, label scheme we're going to use. But if we look at something like Sember that our authors group is proposing, a Yang Sember, we do have the three digits and the first two digits are kind of reserved for the stuff that matters as far as the API goes. And the third digit is defined by definition as things that don't affect the API. So, you know, at least for that revision scheme, we do have the ability to be very clear about which which parts of the SEMVR are API affecting and which aren't. Um, the problem is our generalized Yang versioning draft, which is supposed to work with any scheme, doesn't necessarily. So like revision date uh, doesn't have that level of, of semantic understanding. Uh, but even in that case, um, you still have uh, examples where that third digit is useful. For example, if you were to fix a typo or a spelling mistake in a description or or um, modify a reference, for example, then I would regard those as being changes that don't, uh, don't actually affect the API. Um, so they're not minor version changes, they just become um, editorial version changes. So you, there's still a use for that digit, even if it's not for white space changes. I agree. I'm just saying it feels like the white space changes quite easily fit into that, and they won't cause confusion that there's been an API change. 
by including them. At uh, least I'm, for Semver. Yeah, I, I'm in the queue uh, as a, a contributor. I, that makes sense to me, using that third digit. So, sorry, Luke, could you just clarify that a bit more, your comment? I wasn't quite sure where you're aligning to. Um, not your comment, I think. Um, it, having the ability to distinguish a specific version and refer to it, um, whether it the, is useful, even if it's the only consumer is just people. And so, uh, I, you know, for the first two digits, certainly uh, if the Yang is the same, maybe you don't want to change that. But um, for the, the, the document management um, uh, purposes, using that third digit to cover white space or um, non-visible to Yang changes seems like a reasonable, a reasonable thing. I'm not sure if it causes any problems, and um, perhaps you think it does, and that's why you were opposed to it, Rob. Uh, Rob, I don't know if you want to respond, but Jason is in queue. I'll defer to you. Can I just... Actually, Rob, yeah, go ahead and respond, and then I'll, I'll go ahead. Um, so the only, the only, the problem that came up, that I think I have most sympathy with, is the one gate related to generating Yang from from other sources other inputs so if it's generated from yin for example and then um the concern i think was that if you uh go from yang generate yin and then come back to yang i don't I'm not sure that's a plausible example but if you take yin and then generate yang then the fact that the revision is tied uh, or the ver or version or revision is tied to the white space isn't necessarily that helpful so that's a particular case. And it, it does have the benefit, though, if you tie it to the white space of the file, it makes the checksum very easy. It gives that a very well-defined meaning that the checksum is just a standard checksum of the uh, contents of the file. So that has, that's the big benefit of it. Do other people on the call have a view on this? That would be useful to hear other views as well, other input, if people do have a particular um, opinion on this. The interesting thing is you had Jason in queue, but he removed himself from the queue with your question. Balaj, please. Balaj, go ahead. You might be on mute, Balaj. Okay. Do you hear me now? Yes. So one problem we constantly have had with these wine spaces that people took a, a, a Yang file, <clears throat> copied it over to their own disk, changed changed the uh, let's say line and line ending from Windows to Linux or vice versa. So and then people thought that yes, this is a different Yang file. So I don't insist on anything, but we constantly had uh, such false positives about changes in the Yang file, where what actually happened that someone removed, let's say, the last new line after the last line. And then we started finding out, that, okay, what did, what did they actually do? It was a constant, <clears throat> constant work and a constant hassle to find out that Yes, they find, removed two spaces from the end of a line, and then now it looks like if it's different. Thanks. Jason? So, so I guess uh, about Balash's comment. So Balash, I guess, you know, if we, if you have two version, if you have version 100 floating around and, and somebody puts it into Unix or and someone else takes it into DOS and then they pass the file around, they're going to have two versions of 100 floating around that have maybe different lengths or different checksums. They're somehow different, but they're lo both labeled 100. So if we, if we kind of say, you know, now that, that's for kind of versions, I'd say, that are floating around. But the module owner, the definitive publisher, has some place or some set of places where they 
publish the definitive set of of their modules. And I think that's the place that's more relevant to me as to where the where the official version of the module is and what it contains. Um, if we, no matter which way we go on this, um, like if we if we don't require people to bump the the version when they do white space changes, then we're still going to have that problem that different people are going to grab the version one zero zero. They may check may make whatever white space changes and now you have multiple versions floating around being emailed around being posted here and there um i think all at least as far as what i think we're saying is that the definitive publisher of the module in the place they definitively publish the modules should bump the number if they make white space changes and definitively publish another version You know, Rob's case about converting back and forth or even tools that convert, that's all fine. But if someone uses a different underlying source language and they use that in their production system to then produce Yang, well, we're talking about Yang revisions here, not their underlying revision. So they're going to publish some Yang. If they change their tools and it changes their white space, I would argue it's their responsibility to either bump the version or make sure their tools produce consistent white space output. That's just, that's my view on it. I agree with you, but in practice, this is a big hassle. Even in standardization, uh, let's say in 3GPP, people started editing in Git, uh, GitLab natively, and then they changed a lot of white space because the GitLab local editor does that and then we looked for is this really different or just messed up so okay that's my point balash on that point like what what is triggering someone to get confused like they're they're looking at two files and they're seeing that the length is different. Like, are they running a checksum and seeing they're different and then they're confused? Uh, they are running a diff tool on it and then they are seeing that it, those are the files seem different, but practically, yeah, it's just the it, most typical was this line ending that was changed. Okay, but if we don't bump the version, I think that same problem occurs. So if we say if we say, you know, white space doesn't matter, then there can be two versions of that of that module floating around. And anyone who does a diff on those two versions is going to see all those differences and get confused. So I guess I don't I don't know if I I don't I don't if we if we don't require people to bump the editorial digit, I think your problem's still gonna be there, right? If we consider that these are actually the same files, so do we declare that yep, insignificant uh, white space doesn't make them different, then I think that helps. But people's diff tools are going to show them as different. They're going to see a difference on every line if the line endings changed. <coughs> Yep, but we don't have to argue in that case that now how how different that is. I I, I guess. Um, I mean, this also comes down to you know whether people need to whether we want to allow whether we want to stick with kind of standard diff and checksum tools to figure out differences in modules, or whether you we need Yang specific checksum tools and Yang specific diff tools. So Jason, I was just going to make a comment, um, Srop here, on the one. I can certainly see the benefit of if you had fixed the white space, say the file was badly formatted and you wanted to clean it up, I can certainly see justification in saying in that case, it definitely makes sense to bump the editorial number to make it clear that this is the this is the good version that people should be using. This is the updated one. So, so that sort of case is fine. 
I still wonder then, though, is does that still mean that on any white space change you have to bump the editorial or whether it becomes something that is optional that that you should do it or you must do it, I think, is the question. I think we have Rashad and Jorgen in the queue. John, it, it, Dan, if you're asking people to talk, I can't hear what you're saying yet. I'm not. I think it's thing, uh, the discussion has been going rather well. So, But okay. yeah, uh, I, if uh, Rashad hasn't got this question. No, I've got one thing. I've just got one thing to say back to what Jason was saying, you know, regarding you know, Balaz was saying how you diff and you don't know. I think actually having an editorial bump, and I forget whether that's been said already, said it in the past, actually helps the person saying, hey, there's been an editorial bump, somebody took the time to compare, and he's telling me that I should not care about this change, so I won't bother doing a diff. As opposed to, it's the same version number, I have no idea whether this is accidental or on purpose. I see that Lou made a comment that says that this depends on how you run the tool, and I suppose that was in relation to. Yeah, I th I, that was an old comment. Uh, that was an old comment that we, we don't need to talk about it at the mic. I think the you know someone already made the comment. Uh, you might have Yang specific have, tooling. Right then we have Jurgen. So I think that, that Rob made a very important point. Uh, it's, it needs to be, it's important to be clear what the version number stands for. Is it the content or is it the serialization of the content to so the specific file format? Um, and that will answer the question, kind of, depending on how you decide what the version number stands for. The other problem, if, if you load a, a file into an editor that does white space changes for you, without you actually having control, um, clearly that won't assign a new version number. So the, the problem of tools doing line and conversion and so on, I mean, that's going to remain with us. That is not going to change. And if you have decent diff tools, uh, they, they will handle it. Or if you have your versioning repository set up properly, it will handle it. Um, but I think that the key question is really to, to be clear of what does the version number really version? Is it the, the collection of definitions or is it the precise layout in a sequence of bytes that is being versioned? Thank you. Jason? I guess uh, along the lines of what you're going to say, I guess we also want to figure out, you know, who do we want to make things easier for? consumers or producers my 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 feeling is that is that we probably want to make life a little bit easier for consumers that's generally a larger number than produ producers so the producer of a module is you know one entity or a bunch of people working together but consumers is going to be a wider variety of organizations and 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 people so my my feeling is it's easier on the consumers if they get told that there's been a bump for editorial changes. So, you know, I go back to Balash's problem. So if there's two versions, if there's two copies of version 100 floating around, the consumers will know, even if diff tools say there's a diff, the consumer will know, well, there's probably, that's probably just some white space stuff from my editor because there was no bump. But if a producer actually wants to clean up and make a change and does some things, you know, I think the onus is on them to bump the version to 101, because then now you have, you know, those two versions of the file floating around and the consumers know, oh, actually, you know, there was some intended uh, editorial fixes in, in this 101 version. I'm not just looking at, um, you know, carriage return line feed changes. I just want to state that 
<laughs> what Jurgen said, I very much like that we should define if a version is a sequence of bytes within an exact layout or a Yang Sin semantic that has the same API meaning. Which one do we mean? We should, whatever we decide, we should decide, uh, describe that or specify that. I think that Jason described that very nicely earlier that we have three duties and the two first ones are for the API version and the third one is for any sort of editorial changes. And it would work quite nicely to put editorial changes of all kinds, including white space on the third duty. So I think you're up, otherwise I'll go. Go ahead. Um, okay, I'll make my comment in and then let Joe go afterwards. So just on the, so I agree with um, Jason in terms of we should be optimizing for consumers. But one issue that we potentially have is if a file has been published and it's been published in a format that's not great, then as a consumer, if the version number is tied to the exact file layout, you have no way of sort of cleaning up that file and making a copy of it that because you're not allowed to give that copy the same version number and you can't allocate a new version number because you don't own that file. There's just no way to say, actually you took the IETF modules that have been formatted to 72 characters or 73 characters and then say, actually I'd like to make them formatted to 80 or something to make them easier to read or longer. Then that, that becomes not an option. There's no way to do that if the version number is tied to the file. And I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing. Can made a comment that I assume that the module maintainer has freedom to bump versions as he she likes. This, however, should not imply that the tool generating a slightly different file request to call the maintainer to bump the version. Maybe you want to comment on that further, Jurgen, if you like. Yeah, so just, just to be aware, I think you've skipped um, uh, Joe at least, and maybe someone else. So, Joe, if you want to get back in the queue, just do plus Q to make sure we don't lose you. Uh, I think uh, Jürgen, uh, Jan asked you to bump Joe. I just didn't want to lose Joe, that's all. Go ahead, Jürgen. Yes, I, I, I just tried to point out the difference between the maintainer of a module having control over the version number space and can decide when it is appropriate to bump which version field. Uh, and then there's a consumer or someone working with the module. And if that person has... has having tools that generate slightly different file layouts of the same content. I, I think we should not require that those people then go back to the maintainer and, and get a, a version number for it. I mean, how, how do I actually know which one is the better white spaced version of, of a module? I, I, I don't think that really makes sense. Joe, please. Thanks. I'm Joe Clark. I'm in agreement with Jurgen. I, I think that a module publisher is going to, that they're going to know, <clears throat> excuse me, just like if I am using a source code control system, if I clean up a module, check it in, <clears throat> I get a new revision for it, I might pu I'll probably publish that with editorial changes. I think just like with the imports, we have two different situations, two different issues here. I think the moral of the story is we need good tooling. Uh, because a lot of times people are going to just pull modules off of the server um, from a, a, a consumption standpoint. And the server may compact things to preserve memory, space, whatever. Um, it, but it doesn't mean that the semantic meaning of what you pull, what the client pulls down to the server is any different. So if I had a, a, a 1.00, two, two 1.00 copies of the same module, um, I'm still going to need some Yang aware tooling to really be able to say, do I have the same module? So I think one issue is, yes, by all means, mo module publishers, if they're going to do a, a, a formatting cleanup to make it easier to read, that's editorial and they should be encouraged to make that, that, um, that revision change. 
for the on the consumption side, if we don't have Yang aware tooling that makes it easy to uh, truly diff a, a Yang module semantically between two, um, we're going to run into problems anyway because we're we're just going to see different people aren't always going to go back to the package and pull the canonical version and, and do the checksum. They're going to consume it the way they're going to consume it. And that might involve pulling it off the server. And that server might have done some optimization um, for it, I, I think. I was just going to add one more thing that I thought of, actually, is we've been busy talking about um, version numbers here, but we also need, need to remember that in terms of the Yang files, that we have to have a unique revision date for each version, effectively. So we're adding both of those. And although we're talking about the meaning of related to version numbers, I think they sort of equally apply to the revision dates as well, as in if you change the layout of the file, do you have to have a new revision date? Um, or Or can you... Um, change the format of the file with the same revision date. I think the two go hand in hand. Uh, yeah, although I'd say I'd phrase it a bit differently. If you are the owning publisher of the module and you're publishing a new version of the module you own in the place that you publish it officially, then you have to. Like, there's been some examples of well, if I take ITF interfaces and I do my own reformatting, that's all fine. Like any organization. You know, for their own purposes, they can change some four mega module, but they're not going to republish that as an official new version. They can include it in whatever repository they want, but all they're saying is that this is the, you know, this is the Cisco copy or the Nokia copy of ITF interfaces. Like they, they aren't warranting that that's the official one zero zero if they're publishing, you know, some other copy or distributing some other copy of ITF interfaces. But but when somebody downloads that file, they're going to they're either going to see the same version number, in which case then you're allowing it is tied to the semantics of the the nodes rather than the file format, or you have to give it a different version number, which isn't allowed unless you're the maintainer. So so you can make a private copy with the same version number as long as you don't share it with anyone, and even then the tools with doing um, checksums would fail if the checksum is done over the textual format of the file rather than over the semantics of the file. Yeah, but if you're looking at somebody else's copy of ITF interfaces, then you know you and that person who made the copy have to work out how to identify what that is. Like, I, can, can I, I ask still think a clarifying yeah. question here? Does it have the same revision date and revision number or different? Let Presumably, it would have the same. Uh, it's right. Let me so why is that we, a different version? We have reached the top of the hour. We have one minute to summarize. So let's do that, I think. Uh, go ahead, please. Now, from, uh, from the discussion about this second uh, topic that we discussed now, I think that uh, there's no clear consensus even on this call. I, I heard many strong arguments for both sides. Or for, I mean, there was maybe three options. Uh, so I don't know how, how we should go on, but uh, would the, the chair people would like to conclude the call somehow formally? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you all for participating. Uh, stay tuned for the follow-up meeting that Jason mentioned. So there is going to be some suggestions of uh, additional discussion on versioning. And uh, we're at the top of the hour. So thank you all very much for participating. All right, bye out. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. -bye.